Hello, welcome everyone. We're talking about biotech and biopharmaceuticals with veteran research analyst, Dr. Craig Savanovich on the Russo Edge podcast show. Welcome to the Russo Ed's podcast show, everyone. Today, we're having a very good conversation with our good friend, Dr. Greg Savanovich. And of course, Greg is the managing director of biotechnology and biopharmaceutical equity research, Mizuho Securities. He's had over 20 years of experience in healthcare. Greg has had research roles at both Bulge Bracket and healthcare dedicated boutique investment banks. He's had corporate experience with operating roles in business development and strategy at top-tier global biopharmaceutical companies, including AbV and Biogen. Greg, welcome to the show. How you been doing, my friend? I'm doing well, Salman. It's great to see you. Great to be part of uh, your forum here, and uh, I look forward to this discussion. Yeah, it's going to be great. Look, let's go ahead and, and get started, because I know you've been following the biotech industry for more than 20 years now. How has the sector evolved uh, over the last few years? Yeah, so I think, you know, part of the reason that I'm excited to be part of the biotech uh, sector and industry is uh, just based on all the progress and innovation that we're seeing across small and large companies, both here in the U.S. and outside the U.S. I mean, I feel like um, a lot of the learnings over the past several decades are starting to bear fruit. Yeah. Um, we are seeing lots of innovation as it relates to new treatments for cancer and Alzheimer's disease and metabolic diseases as well. And so um, I think in the last few years, um, what we've seen is we've certainly seen an explosion in the number of companies that are publicly traded. Um, and so a lot of capital has flowed into the sector, um, oh, I'd say over the past five years in particular. Um, we are seeing that because of high interest rates, um, that is making the capital available to the biotech sector a little bit more constrained, a little bit more limited, and it is creating some pressures uh, by and large for the smaller, less well-capitalized companies. It is unfortunately making them um, think about you know, which are their programs that they want to place the highest priority around, and that means sometimes deprioritizing other uh, maybe earlier stage or or riskier yeah. programs. Um, so we're at a place right now. We're ahead of the 2024 U.S. presidential elections. Yeah. You know the XBI, which is the ETF that many of us in the industry track to kind of serve as a gauge of sentiment in the sector, has been relatively flat over the past year and change. Um, mm -hmm. We have to get through elections. Yeah to uh, hopefully have um, lower a lower interest rate environment, which could make um, capital raising for some of our companies um, make it a little bit easier for them. Um, and unfortunately, we still have some greater geopolitical uncertainty, which uh, creates kind of a risk off environment. And, and yeah. uh, biotech is very much a risk on type of investment. And so um, a lot of these macro factors are making it a bit um, challenging for the biotech sector. Yeah, let's look ahead to Q4. I know you just talked about the election as one of those mm -hmm. things. What are some of the other key factors do you think yeah. will, will impact the biotech sector? Yeah, I think it is primarily we need some clarity around who's going to be the next president here in the U.S. I think yeah. it's just the markets, generally speaking, prefer certainty. Obviously, if you've got a big kind of election, whether the country stays um, more democratic in terms of the presidential, you know, who's sitting in the White House versus going yeah. Republican. Um, so that's a big uh, event that we kind of need to get past. Hopefully we have a, you know, an orderly election. Uh, hopefully we <laughs> yes, can get yes. back to business relatively mm -hmm. quickly. That will provide mm -hmm. some certainty in the market. Um, and again, we have seen the U.S. Fed indicate that it is um, not raising interest rates anymore. In fact, if anything, it might be lowering interest rates. So those yeah. two things in particular, at least here for the U.S. biotech market, are, are going to be what's most important for us to kind of um, know what's next for the biotech sector, more, more broadly speaking. Mm -hmm. Let's get maybe more granular. Uh, what therapeutic areas or technologies within the biotech sector do you expect to see um, maybe significant growth in terms of investment? 
Yeah, so it's something that we focus on a lot here at, at Mizuho and a lot of my other um, colleagues who sit at other firms. You know, we talk to investors, we talk to folks in venture capital, um, and we also think about what we think will be kind of the emerging technologies. And, and right now, it seems like the top three areas um, that the biotech and pharmaceutical companies are kind of investing in will be things like, no surprise, obesity. And what is everyone's kind of, uh, at least from a large company perspective, what is their obesity strategy? Mm -hmm. um, and whether it involves going down a GLP-1 route or not, we have some other more interesting, novel, and promising mechanisms of, of action, um, including those that target kind of maybe myostatin or CB1 or other areas, maybe the inflammasome as well. But um, beyond obesity, which is what everyone seems to want to talk about most, we do have um, major interest in um, what's called the INI space or inflammatory diseases or immunological diseases. Um, we're seeing a lot of um, companies who maybe previously were working in oncology and because of a little bit of an overlap between how drugs work in oncology, they may also yeah. work in kind of inflammatory diseases. So we're seeing mm -hmm. a lot of interest in, in the INI space. Neuroscience has been an area of a lot of growth recently, whether it's Alzheimer's disease, where it's uh, psychiatry diseases. A lot of that is driven by new drug approvals, but also by um, M&A that's taken uh, place where large companies have acquired small companies. We saw two companies last year. One got acquired for $14 billion. That was Karuna Therapeutics, a name we used to cover. There was another yeah. company called Cerebell Therapeutics that was acquired by AbV for about um, $9 billion, yeah. also a company we used to cover. Those companies were focused on psychiatric diseases. So neuro is making a big comeback as well, I'd say, over the past five years. And then lastly, there will always be a focus on oncology because, yeah. you know, unfortunately, cancer is still, uh, you know, with us uh, and affects all of us on some level. Yeah. Um, we still need um, better treatments, and certainly if we can find cures, that, that would be great. Greg, with companies that maybe you're following maybe more directly, are there any specific key mid or, say, late-stage clinical data sets or other catalysts uh, that you'll be watching or paying attention to, uh, especially when it comes to maybe uh, the impact for investor sentiment? Yeah. So I think that, the, um, you know, the biotech sector is full of uh, clinical data related catalysts. Um, that is kind of the lifeline of investing in biotech. Mm -hmm. Investors try to get really smart around a phase two or phase three clinical trial and make a big bet. And yeah. so I think there are a number of events that we're looking for. Um, and as it relates to companies that we follow here at Mizuho, and especially under my coverage, there's one particular company, it's one of our top ideas actually, Axome Therapeutics, they're a New York-based biopharmaceutical company. So they've got in um, the fourth quarter, two different big phase three readouts, one for a drug that's already on the market for depression, a drug is called Ovelity, um, but they are also testing that same drug in Alzheimer's disease, particularly as it relates to patients who are very agitated. So treating agitation in Alzheimer's disease. There's one drug that's approved on the market right now. It just got approved last year. That wow. drug is called Rexulti, but that drug unfortunately has a black box warning mm. um, for an increased risk in mortality, and unfortunately an increased risk in mortality in elderly patients with dementia, which is exactly the Alzheimer's patient that's population right. to begin with. So wow. Ovelity, which is approved in depression, it does not carry a black box warning for depression, and now it's being tested in phase three clinical trials for agitation and Alzheimer's disease. We are expecting that readout in the fourth quarter. We already have a positive phase two data uh, set, and we have already a positive phase three first data set. So there's a lot of expectations and interest in Axome for this one drug ability in Alzheimer's disease agitation. They also have another drug that's on the market. Um, that drug is called Sinosi. It's already approved in treating excessive uh, daytime sleepiness in patients with narcolepsy, but they are testing that drug in ADHD. Um, and we know ADHD, 17 million patients in the, in the US, both adults and kids, um, and they're testing their drug in ADHD. That's also a fourth quarter readout. So that's a very big, important readout. Also on the neuro side, we are expecting um, in the fourth quarter as well, um, a company that I cover called Elector 
has an important phase two readout for a drug that's partnered with AbbVie. And this is also on the Alzheimer's disease side. So, um, you know, Alzheimer's, we do have two uh, or at least one uh, newer drug for Alzheimer's disease that's called Lakembi. Yeah. Um, that is from Azi and Biogen. We are expecting or I think we may already have a Lilly drug that's approved. Um, that's also those two drugs target beta amyloid. The view is if you can lower the plaque burden yeah. in the brain, that's good for patients. Mm -hmm. yeah. The Elector drug is actually using a different mechanism. It's not targeting beta amyloid directly. It is trying to like uh, amp up the microglia, which would clear the debris. It's a very novel mechanism of action. Yeah. It's targeting it's what's called TREM2. We're going to get a phase two readout in the fourth okay. quarter, and that could be very exciting for patients with Alzheimer's disease. Wow, that it sounds very promising uh, and, and looks like a bright future. There's some very good things on the horizon. As a cell site equity research analyst, your mm -hmm. primary client audience is the buy site institutional investor community. So what's your sense of the current buy side view of the biotech sector? Yeah, so um, I think the buy side, um, you know, has had a very tough go at it over the past couple of years. Again, if we use the XBI mm -hmm. as kind of the gauge of where general sentiment is, it's been about a, at the 100 level um, for quite some time. I think the buy side is still very interested in biotech. Mm -hmm. It's been hard to make money by and large because it is biotech after we're trying to predict the outcomes of clinical yeah. trials. We mm -hmm. get very deep into the weeds. We have some very, very sophisticated investors, particularly those that are in this specialist uh, biotech community. We also have more general biotech investors at larger um, you know, funds that are perhaps more generalist and long only in nature. Biotech has always been high risk, high reward. There's always an interest in like, hey, if I can play a certain name, maybe I'll get like a 20, 30, 50, 80% return in a very short time. There's always going to be an interest from the buy side community in biotech, but it is very hard sometimes to correctly call whether a trial is going to work or not. Um, I think net, net, um, the, the sentiment is still positive. But there's been a lot of um, data events that have not gone our way. Um, we're hoping to see a lot more positive events that hopefully are good for both patients and investors as well. So I'd say, like, you know, we're still um, fighting the good fight and trying to make very smart bets. And certainly we want to see new treatments and um, potential cures for patients. I do think the buy side is looking forward to, though, um, perhaps 2025 and maybe putting 2024 behind them. Yeah. Well, one last question, Greg, before we get you out of here. How important is it for management to have a good relationship uh, with analysts? And uh, as an analyst yourself, uh, are there any best practices you can share with our listeners on how management can interact with analysts uh, on the buy side, particularly with investors? Yeah. So, um, look, I think this business is about trust. Yeah. Um, and I think for management teams, it's very important to uh, establish credibility. Um, and I think the more transparent you can be uh, on the data or the assets that you have, and sometimes data are not perfect, sometimes data are not great. But I think um, investors, um, analysts on the buy side, as well as analysts like myself who sit on what we call the sell side, we do appreciate when management teams tend to be a bit more direct, a little bit more honest, a bit more truthful. We understand that biotech is about buying into the idea of what you're working on. Um, we want to be there. We want to partner with you and, and believe in that vision. But we have to allow us to do our own homework, our own diligence. So I really think that it is very important for management teams to um, work, um, I'd say, uh, in in partnership with their investors, work in partnership with their sell side analysts and other key stakeholders, um, and to basically operate in a, um, an environment of honesty and transparency. And I think that's what we value the most. I think when we see companies that maybe get into the business of um, maybe spinning data in a way that perhaps yeah, there might be a sliver of, of optimism, but like on balance, like the reality is, you know, it's like when you, um, you know, play blackjack and the cards speak for themselves. The data <laughs> yeah. are data, right? The data are data. Either you, you busted or you didn't. Yeah. Um, and we, we, we would prefer to see management teams say, look, 
calling a spade a spade. We gave it our best shot. We're going to move on. Um, and that way it is better for everyone involved. Great stuff, Greg, per usual. We knew you would knock it out of the park. <laughs> and, Thanks, Solomon. <laughs> and certainly we appreciate you joining us as our guest here on the Russo Edge podcast show. Once again, Greg Savanovich, Dr. Greg Savanovich, of course, Managing Director of Biotech and Biopharmaceutical Equity Research, Mizuho Securities. We thank you for joining us on the Russo Edge podcast show, and we want everyone to continue to tune in. We'll catch you next time. Thank you, Solomon. It was a pleasure to be on the Russo Edge.